Okay, so today we're going to talk about something with not a very exciting name, but basically the way I would, I would uh, make your viewers interested is it's a way of programming the kernel without programming the kernel. I've heard some people say what JavaScript is to the web, uh, eBPF is to the operating system. So there's a big important distinction in most modern computers between user space down here, and it's where we spend most of our prior time programming and running applications, and the kernel, which is dealt with by the operating system, and the kernel is doing things like taking care of the low level details of files and um, making sure that display drivers and everything run properly. One issue comes if you want to ask questions about, say, file access or TCP transfers or things like that. So you want to ask questions that are you're interrogating the operating system to some extent. You're monitoring your system. And if you want to ask the question about, say, TCP connections or, say, file I.O., and you're writing your monitoring program, you have this great new idea for how you're going to stop a distributed denial of service or something like this, but you're writing it in user space. So you need to ask these questions via an API, Application Program Interface, and that limits what you can do, and it puts a bit of a drag on how quickly you can do it. So if you really want to know, you want to monitor file access real quickly, you want to monitor TCP connections, input, output, things using memory or whatever. Ideally, you want something running up here in the kernel. So ideally, you want your program up here. I should emphasize the kernel isn't magically faster, but for doing accesses on whether a file is uh, being accessed, for looking at things like file read writes, TCP in and out, the kernel is much quicker. You don't have to go through this API and make calls upwards into the kernel. You're already there. There's a lot of problems with that, though. If you want that program to reside in the kernel, kernel programming is pretty tricky. And then you say to somebody, hey, oh, I've written this great new monitoring tool. Oh, great. Uh, what do I do to run your application? Well, step one, Rebuild the kernel of your computer. So you've already got a big kind of barrier to entry. Or let's imagine you're working on Linux, which everybody should be. Uh, then you'll say, uh, dear Linus Torvalds, uh, could you uh, put my program in your kernel? I have been very good. Richard Clegg and hope that he's going to include it. And that maybe takes a few years. So is there some way we can get little hooks into the kernel, um, and it turns out there's a little virtual machine. In a way, I think it's really badly misnamed now. EBPF, Extended Berkeley Packet Filter, which is a really weird name because its origins are really strange. Around about the 90s, uh, early 90s, some researchers in Berkeley developed what they called a packet filter. They were networking people, and they were looking at network traces, and I wanted some simple way to say, give me all TCP connections to port 80, or give me all UDP packets, please. So they wrote kind of a, a regex, regular expression match for packets, right? And I've been aware of this for years. But then a few years ago, I started noticing loads of my networking friends in conferences. They were presenting all this stuff on Berkeley Packet Filter. And I was like, What's going on here? Packet filter can't do that. Sometime around about 2014, people came up with the idea that oh, this packet filter can run in the kernel. Maybe it can do clever things in the kernel. And then they started to extend it and extend it and give it more and more abilities. Um, and now it's gone so far away from being this 
thing that filters packets and tells you which packets which match expression. So now in um, Linux and sort of working in Windows, and I believe a Mac version is on the way, we've got this little virtual machine sitting in the kernel and you in user space can write some code and if it matches what the virtual machine wants, you can be running little code hooks up in the kernel. Now what's the use of that? It means you can do incredibly quick monitoring without putting any kind of drag on the CPU. This thing has even been taken a little bit further. So there is something called XDF. So we have, if we have our network interface card, so there the packets are coming in here to be passed up to the kernel. There's even something called XDF, which will allow these bits of these BPF programs draw on the interface card. So you're not even taking the burden on the main parts of your computer now. The burden of computation might be going on the network interface card. So we've got a way of writing programs in user space, having parts of the logic, the parts of the logic that need to be fast run on the kernel or even on the NIC. And it's, it's just, there's an explosion of monitoring tools. So for example, one that loads of you probably use, your Android battery monitoring tool, if you've got a modern version of Android, it's probably running eBPF somewhere in the mix to look at powered events and battery events and stop, stop starts for bits of software. And you know, sometimes if you've got an Android phone, you'll get that thing saying, application Facebook is using lots of battery. Do you want to stop it? That is probably using eBPF somewhere in the mix on a modern Android phone. I've only just been learning this, so I'm going to show you the world's worst demo of this because um, I'm, I'm not a skilled programmer on eBPF, but what I wanted to do was create a kind of minimum application for viewers to see the kind of things that this can do, but absolutely don't copy what I've done because it's really bad. <laughs> what I've done is a little Python demo here. Um, and I will say this, this is, uh, this is very kind of bodged together. And the first thing you'll notice is that this doesn't look like Python because at the top of the screen here, you can see it defining BPF Berkeley packet filter text. And then we've got a C program hiding as a massive amount of text in our Python program. So we've got a program here called don't touch dot py. It's looking like a C program. At the top here, we can see a little structure that's going to store a name and the length of it because we're doing old school C now. So we need to say when we've got a string, we need to say not only the characters, but the length. So that's because it's running on the kernel. It's quite a low level. Yeah, language. yeah. So these, these BPF programs need to be really low level. It's a virtual machine that's pretty much assembler as I understand it. BPF hash is a structure and this line's giving it a name access. It's telling us it's going to map this info about names to an integer. This is not the way I should have done it. I have copied this code from a man called Brendan Gregg who's literally written a book on BPF. Don't worry too much about this bit of the code. This is just grabbing the name of a file being accessed. So some file is being accessed, and here I'm storing the name of that file, and then I am storing the name itself. So I'm storing the length of the name, and then the name, pushing into my hash the number one. Why am I pushing in the number one? Because I shouldn't be using a hash at all to do this. I'm just adapting somebody else's code. So I'm creating a hash map where I should really be doing something else, but I'm creating a hash map between the name of a file that has been accessed and the number one. So every time a file is accessed, this is going to happen. Here's the Python. So here now we're back in Python land, a little bit more comfortable. And this special line says, uh, compile me up that text that I was looking at, that BPF program, compile it up. 
and these flags are just going to stop it spitting a lot of warnings to the screen. And here's a crucial bit. We're going to attach a kernel level probe to the event VFS read, a read in the file system. So every time a file is read in the file system, we're going to call our little BPS program and our little BPS program is going to read and put a name and the number one into this little hash map. So now whenever a file is read, it goes to the hash map and is associated with the number one. And yes, that is a terribly inefficient way to do it. Now we're in proper Python mode and we're entering a loop, sleeping for a second, looking for a keyboard interface, interrupt in case we're bored of the program, and grabbing that table access. And that table is a table of the name of every file that has been accessed. We're going to look through that table and see if we can find a file called handsoff.txt. So that's what we're looking for. If we find that file called handsoff.txt, we're going to play an alert. And if we've alerted too many times, we're going to exit. And that's all we're going to do. And then here, while that's all happened, we're going to clear our list of accessed files. So let's see what happens when we run this program. So I'm going to run don't touch. It needs to be run as root in this case. OK, so now the program's running. Every one second, it's looking down the um, list of files accessed and it's uh, checking whether any of them are called handsoff.txt. Now, when I access the file handsoff.txt, we can say, oh, it's spotted that I've done that, and it's saying, do not look at the file. Try it again, and it's given me another warning, asked you not to look at the file. And we can keep on messing about with that, and it will keep on doing that. Now, OK, that's a really, really silly, silly example. But the original file I've adapted that from was looking at the most accessed files on the system. So instead of just saying, is it handsoff.txt, it was um, sorting them all in Python, sorting them all out, printing them in a table, and showing you a useful monitoring system with the most accessed files on the system. Now, here's the thing. If you're going to run code in the kernel, you have to be pretty sure that it's not going to disrupt your machine. Running stuff in the kernel is inherently a little dangerous. So let's try something else. Let's try something a bit dumb. Let's calculate some Fibonacci numbers. So everybody loves Fibonacci numbers. So my kernel program now is going to calculate some Fibonacci numbers. So I've got a new file. It's almost exactly the same. But we're going to add in something new into our structure. We're going to add in a 64-bit Fibonacci number call, uh, that I'm calling fib. And I'm doing an iterative calculation of Fibonacci. Now, you'll be saying, oh, hold on, Richard. Why are you doing that iteratively? It's the classic recursive program. I'll come to that in a minute. But iteratively, we're going to go around and we're going to add together these Fibonacci numbers, first to second, the usual way we do it, and return the results. So Fibonacci n, and I've got n is 40, which is about what I can do without an overflow. So let me run that. And we're doing exactly the same thing for no reason whatsoever. We're looking at the file system. We're waiting for the don't touch this file. And when I press it, instead of just giving me a warning, it's calculated a fifth the 40th Fibonacci number, which I can look across and see that I've got the correct one. If I'd made it much higher, it would have overflowed. Why am I doing this stupid thing? Because it is a really daft thing to do. One, one thing is, you're putting this thing into the kernel. What if it stopped running? What if it, it, it didn't come back? Now you've got a kind of rogue process in your kernel. Uh, that's not great. So let's see what happens if I remove the increment from that loop. So I've removed the I++. Let's imagine I've just messed up in my programming, as happens so often. So now this is not going to terminate. I've written a, an unterminating loop. And now I try and run this. 
And what has it done? We can see when it's tried to compile the C code, the eBPF compiler has said um, infinite loop detected. So it's spotted that I'm trying to do something sneaky, I'm trying to get this to run forever, or, or I've messed up or whatever. I've done something that's going to not fit within the safety parameters of my kernel, and it's stopped my code compiling. And that's also the reason I'm doing a sort of clunky looking iterative Fibonacci, because the usual recursive Fibonacci, another thing that will make this, this uh, computer says no, is trying to do recursion within, um, within the uh, virtual machine here. So that's actually a really short demo. It's just absolutely a sort of first level taster. Um, but this, um, this is used by lots of things now. Uh, when you look at the companies using eBPF, it's all of the big players. It's Google and Facebook or Meta, as we're supposed to call them now. And the guy whose code I, I was using, Brendan Gregg, is with Netflix. So people and um, the people doing the big networking stuff are all using this. And us researchers are also getting really excited about this. I'll give a particular example slightly local. Uh, Cambridge York uh, and Bologna have done some work and they're using this to detect when IoT devices are producing a different traffic profile than you expect and that might be a sign of a distributed denial of service device. So yeah, this technology, one thing I would say if you're going to play with it, it's one of those technologies where it's at that stage when you read a manual page, uh, you read a blog and you think, that sounds great, I'll implement it. And then you find that that was from 2021 and your operating system is from 2022, so it doesn't quite work anymore. So I would encourage people to have a play with it, but I would also encourage you to have a little bit of patience. So I've written this, for example, in a system called BCC and then about an hour or two after I had um, written it, I found somebody saying, BCC is obsolete, it's so 2022. So it's what I call a rapidly moving target if you want to get interested in this. Because you're in the kernel, yeah. is there a potential here to kind of lock, fry, fry your kind of internal, not fry, but no, lock up the machine? <laughs> you're, you're, thinking, you're thinking of the halt and catch fire? I, I, you, know, you know, it could easily be. It's, so if, if you start running non-terminating loops in your kernel, then potential, potential not great things will happen, which is why it's carefully protecting it's, me from my own foolishness. It, right? it it's trying it's to. trying to trap it, yes. yes. I was a bit mystified with this when I start. So somebody who's looking at my code might go, Richard, what are you doing? You've declared fib with a function, but you haven't declared n. So if I go u64n, Mysteriously now, it lets it compile, which it really shouldn't. Maybe the devs could tell me why that is. Certainly that's beyond my level of knowledge of this system. Um, so you can see a work in progress, but really, really important and lots of production systems are running it. And how much room it's got left. So now the sender knows, if I don't want to overwhelm that computer, I'm only going to send... It got slightly dimmer when we got to this row, and then slightly brighter again when we got to this row. And we might find that, but basically, if you've got a... a